assalamu alaikum and good afternoon everybody thank you for uh, joining uh, actually this webinar uh, uh, completes our one year of of this program so far so this is the 13th webinar we we are doing in this uh, program and uh, now we have nearly 850 members from 10 different countries so alhamdulillah it, it has been uh, quite uh, enjoying and uh, successful journey uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, everybody for your support to run this program okay now coming to uh, today's topic which is uh, programmatic assessment concept and implementation uh, Regarding assessment, a considerable shift in thinking has taken place. The simple statement of from assessment of learning to assessment for learning, seemingly a simple statement has actually revolutionized the concept of uh, uh, assessment and we will see how it has done it. So by this change, uh, there is broadening of the pers uh, perspective in assessment. For example, the types of construct that assessment tries to capture. In traditional uh, way of assessment, we mainly test the knowledge or skills or some soft skills. But here, for example, in type of constructs would include humility or uh, uh, the the, the agency uh, are new, new constructs which are included in the programmatic assessment, also integrity. The way information from various uh, sources is collected and collated, the role of human judgment. Now we, uh, rather than computers deciding about the pass fail, now it is the, the uh, experts who will uh, be making decisions about students' uh, performance if we are following the uh, programmatic assessment. The variety of psychometric methods to determine, for example, it includes a continuous monitoring of, of the students. So there are a number of changes which uh, this new thinking is bringing in the field of assessment. To see the difference between assessment of learning and assessment for learning, for assessment of learning, the examinations are placed at the end of the instructions, a module or a year. Examinations are separated from the educational process and examinations have almost exclusive purpose to determine whether the students have acquired sufficient knowledge or skills to make pass fail decisions. Whereas on the other hand, if we look at the assessment for learning, the process of assessment is embedded within the, within the educational process. So it has part of the daily teaching learning activities. It serves to steer and foster the learning of each individual student. So the, the, the individual student has become uh, the focus of attention in this programmatic assessment. And interestingly, and I think more importantly, assessment has become a part of teaching learning program. Assessment is contributing a lot uh, in the uh, teaching learning program if we follow the programmatic assessment. It provides an inclusive mechanism where we bring uh, the assessment for all relevant it, uh, attributes together before making a pass-fail decision, and this would be explained in a short while. So the purpose of uh, this webinar today is basically to bring awareness about the changes in the thinking in relation to assessment of students uh, in, in medical school and especially the work-based uh, assessment. So that is the main, main purpose of this, uh, this webinar. 
the learning outcomes, the participants of this webinar will be able to, number one, identify the shortcomings of the existing system pro, uh, uh, assessment process in their institutions. Number two, explain the concept of programmatic assessment, programmatic assessment, suggest the solutions of the issues that may arise during the implementation of programmatic assessment and implement the programmatic assessment in their institution. So these are four learning outcomes which we want to achieve uh, during this webinar. Now, first question, why the change? We have been assessing students for decades without any problem, then why we need to change? Question is, are we, have we really been assessing fairly uh, or uh, uh, logically? That's the question we need to answer. Let's look at the current situation first. The current examination system divides the med, uh, the competencies into four separate constructs. Knowledge, psychomotor skills, problem solving skills, and attitude or professionalism. And for each of these constructs, we have a specific instrument of assessment. For example, uh, MCQs for, for knowledge or ASCII for clinical skills. A good assessment in this view is composed of combination of uh, instruments. So we combine the, the results of MCQs, SCQs, OSCEs, short case and long case to make a, a decision uh, for the progression of the student. Now, if we look a bit more into the detail, as pass-fail decision is made on the total score, therefore the individual items, for example, the uh, individual items in, in a, a multiple choice question paper, they become meaningless because it is the only total score which gives meaning and validity to the assessment. Individual questions do not matter. At the end of the day, we have a total marks of uh, an MCQ paper, and that is what uh, matters. It doesn't matter whether there, uh, what kind of questions were being used and what was the importance of each individual uh, question. So, E individual items actually become meaningless, uh, valueless in, uh, in this system, except the allotted marks, which indicate the importance of individual items. But once we uh, convert it into marks, these individual items lose their, uh, their uh, importance or identity. Marks of different items are combined and decisions uh, is based on that. So it can happen that in a theory paper, anatomy can make up for deficiency of physiology. Or a clinical examination, communication skills can make up for clinical, uh, uh, communication skills can make up for uh, clinical skills. In certain situations, theory can make up for clinical skills and vice versa. That is the, the one uh, a problematic issue in, in, in the current assessment system, the making up for deficiencies with inappropriate substitutes. Again, it becomes even more problematic if the two items are, are more meaningful. Take the example of uh, OSCE, a question a uh, station on resuscitation skills and a and station on communication skills. And when we combine the mark, so can good communication skills make up for poor, poor resuscitation skills or vice versa. The traditional psychometrical approaches we use lead us to treat individual stations as intrinsically uh, meaningless. Same example which I gave for multiple choice question, it can apply to uh, OSCE, uh, uh, for example, here. At the end of the day, when we add up the marks of OSCE, so each station in itself becomes meaningless. 
because we are uh, concerned with the total scores and not with the with the stations uh, themselves. Here is another interesting uh, scenario. Take the answers a student gives to a multiple choice question test. At first place, from the answers, it can be derived not only which correct answers were given, but which all, uh, but also which incorrect answers were given. So once we got uh, answers from the students, we know which are the correct answers, which are the incorrect answers. But once we convert it into marks, one or zero score, then it is not known anymore what the incorrect answers were, but only to which questions incorrect answers uh, were given. So actually what happens is that we know uh, which questions uh, uh, were answered incorrectly, yes, we know, but what was the incorrect answer, we don't know. So only we know that so many questions were answered incorrectly, uh, but what was the incorrect answer, we wouldn't know. And we know that uh, in certain situation, actually incorrect answer is even more important than the correct answers, because by analyzing the incorrect answer, at least we get double the information. For example, a student answers that typhoid is caused by Staphylococcus uh, aureus. So here we have more than one information. Number one, student doesn't know that the uh, typhoid is caused by Salmonella. Secondly, student also doesn't know what are the illnesses caused by Staphylococcus. So incorrect answer gives us a lot of information. But unfortunately, by converting it into marks, we lose that information. Then once we uh, get the answer, all answers, we from different sources, we uh, total them up. And now it happens that uh, it is obscure to which items an incorrect and correct answer was given, but only to how many items an incorrect or correct answer was given. Means at, once we total up the score, we don't know which questions were answered correctly or incorrectly. Only thing we know that how many questions were answered correctly or incorrectly. So even the uh, previous information is further lost by totaling up the score. So this total score is then compared to pass fail score. And now it is only known whether the number of uh, correct answer was sufficient or not. How many questions were answered correctly or incorrectly, we don't know. So this is the, the reduction process. Uh, which happens in our uh, current system. And in, in that process, we lose really very important uh, information. Uh, and, the, and therefore, we cannot use that information. And it would be clear in the next few slides. So at the end of the assessment, we don't know which questions were answered correctly, which questions were answered in, incorrectly, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, and which areas need remediation because everything has been converted into two marks and the whole information is lost. The programmatic assessment attempts to address these concerns which um, are really, really important concerns. Why we have these problems in the current uh, assessment sy uh, system. The, the reasons for that, number one, the traditional examination programs are built according to one best instrument for each construct model. For example, OSCEs are for assessing clinical skills and multiple choice questions are for assessing knowledge. So each construct has one so-called one best instrument for assessment. Number two, each of the four components, which is knowledge, psychomotor skills, attitude, problem solving ability, 
are independent of each other. In terms of marking, skills are independent of knowledge. Problem solving is independent of knowledge and skills. So when we mark, we don't consider the additional information attached to that mode of assessment. Problem solving ability is stable. So we assume that a student who has solved one problem is a good problem solver and this ability would be stable in all the situations. Number four, the attempt to capture competence almost entirely by numerical outcomes. This is again a major problem that we want to assess every ability in terms of uh, numbers or numericals and we know very well know that not everything can be assessed uh, by, by giving marks. For example, if you want to assess critical thinking, it would not be possible to assess or give some uh, scores for that. So that is the situation in the current assessment system and those are the problems which uh, are uh, a part of the present assessment system and that's what uh, the programmatic assessment uh, tries to address. So let's look at the, the concept of the programmatic assessment itself. Programmatic assessment is an approach in which information about the learner's competency and progress is continually collected and analyzed. So one important part is that it is a continuous process. It is on daily basis. So, and the other is that its purpose is very different. This continuous uh, collection of information and analysis is meant to inform the learners and their mentors for continuous improvement. Means the feedback would be the most important part. And again, this daily or continuous collection of information would be used to decide about the progression of the students. That's the first uh, part of a programmatic assessment. Second, a programmatic, a programmatic assessment is meaningful by content and not by method of assessment. This is again a huge difference. This is what the revolution is, that the, the, uh, the assessment is based on the content, not by the methods. For example, results of parts of multiple choice question examination may be combined with parts of OSCE to draw conclusions to examine his progress in multiple domains of performance, for example, knowledge and problem solving skills. This would be clear in next few slides as well, but important here is that in programmatic assessment, the marks are, are the uh, results are uh, collated according to the content and not according to the method of assessment. Meaningful by content is a very, very important part of uh, uh, programmatic assessment. One method of assessment can test multiple domains. For example, long case uh, examination can test communication skills, psychomotor skills, knowledge and problem solving skills. The results should be collated in the form of domains and not according to assessment methods. For example, knowledge domain will receive input from multiple sources apart from multiple choice question. For, for example, long case examination, OSCE or problem solving exercise. This means that our assessment schemes or marking schemes have to uh, be changed uh, to according to the attributes which we want to, to uh, assess. Based on the review of these results, remediation plans are provided. Again, an important concept in programmatic assessment that the, the continuous assessment is mainly for remediation, for uh, identifying the weaknesses and the mentors playing a major role and in informing students about uh, the weaknesses and drawing a plan for, uh, for improvement. 
So a continuous dialogue between learner and, and the mentor uh, uh, focuses on the analysis of competence development and personal development, and then feedback is given and remediation plans are, are uh, drawn. Instead of a conventional assessment, such as taking high stake MCQ examination followed by pass fail decision, programmatic assessment addresses both the attained competence levels and their development process. So if we look at the way we are going to uh, redesign our assessment schemes, our so-called marking schemes, so it would not be possible to decide on, on one case, for example, one non case, whether student has failed or passed that case, because our assessment is now totally different. And that is what programmatic assessment promotes, that we cannot make a pass fail decision just on one method of assessment. So programmatic assessment is about collecting and combining assessment information which is based on the content, not based on the methods, from various instruments, valuing the resultant information to come to decision and taking action upon these decisions. So questions are, what information needs to be collected? How to collect the information? How to combine the information from various instruments? How to value the resultant information and how to make decisions and how to implement these decisions. We will try to answer these questions one by one. First, what information needs to be collected? In programmatic assessment, information from all assessment sources can be used to inform all the competency domains. And all competency domains are informed by various uh, information sources. For example, OSCE, apart from assessing the clinical skills, also assesses knowledge. Written examination, for example, extended matching type of question or modified essay question can also assess decision-making skills. And communication skill stations in OSCE can also assess knowledge. So means one um, method of assessment can be used to assess multiple constructs or multiple attributes. And then the marks are divided according to those attributes. How to collect and collate the information? Marks or assessment uh, information is collated according to attributes. Knowledge, psychomotor skills, problem solving skills, attitude, rather than methods of uh, assessment. For example, communication skills can be assessed through multiple examination methods, history taking in long case, counseling station in OSCE, or demonstration of use of inhaler in OSCE. Apart from psychomotor skills, we do get, can get uh, assessment of knowledge as well. We must be clear about the attributes we wish to assess and attributes reflect the values and needs of the society and different organizations or nations have identified uh, the required attributes. Usually the medical councils would come up with uh, such document. Here are a few examples uh, from CanMed from uh, Canada. They, their attributes include medical expert, communicator, collaborator, manager, health advocate, scholar, or professional. This means that when they are assessing the students and they would see um, each method of assessment that what are the multiple uh, attributes that one assessment method can assess. Similarly, there is a list by um, Accreditation Council for uh, Graduate Medical Education from US. Uh, MQF is from Malaysia. They, they have uh, divided into five components, knowledge and understanding, cognitive skills, functional work skills, personal and entrepreneurial skills, 
ethics and professionalism. Uh, this uh, uh, reference I'm giving here from a medical teacher in 2011, the authors have uh, simplified it and divided it into four components. It's knowledge, psychomotor skills, attitude, and problem solving skills. If uh, uh, we recall our discussion on, on competency-based medical education, then the EPAs can become the attributes. For example, number one, capability, which includes specific knowledge, skills, experience, situational awareness, integrity, then reliability, humility, agency. So it is important for us to identify the attributes and then apply uh, those at, uh, attributes during our assessment of the medical students. How to combine the information from various uh, instruments? The traditional approach in most uh, assessment program relies on adding the results according to the instruments. For, for example, adding marks of OSCE. Research has shown that it is not the format which determines what a test or an item assesses, but it is the content. So uh, format is not so important, content is really important component of assessment. And theoretically, it is more logical to combine information that is similar in content and not because it is similar in format. Student must demonstrate competence in each construct, whether medical expert or uh, professionalism before being certified. So the relevant information from all sources of assessment, whether it's OSCE or long case or multiple choice question, whether it is formal or informal, should be combined for each construct to make a final decision. For example, medical knowledge can be assessed from written examination, history taking in and clinical examination or counseling uh, stations in OSCE. Psychomotor skills can be assessed during clinical examination, long case, short case, and OSCE. Problem solving skills can be assessed in, uh, in written examination, for example, modified essay question, as well as clinical examination, uh, including, for example, the investigating a patient, interpreting the results, making a diagnosis, drawing a management plan, proposing steps to prevent the illness in individuals and community. All these components are related to problem solving skills. So students assessment from these uh, components should go to the attribute of problem solving skills. Attitude and professionalism can be assessed through the approach to the patient, team player, proactiveness, so individual assess, uh, elements of assessment become meaningful in themselves. This is in contrast to our previous um, uh, uh, discussion, the, the one of the weakness in present uh, system, assessment system is that makes the each component as meaningless, but here in programmatic assessment, each element becomes meaningful in itself. For example, the low score uh, on, on an item in history taking in the mini CX is meaningful in itself and can lead to remedial action. So if student is weak in that component, we can plan a remedial action on that component. And it's not necessary to combine all the marks to make a decision of a pass or fail. So that is the basic concept. So if uh, we want to summarize, it would be that uh, the it is a continuous process. Number two, the feedback is a very, very important component for continuous improvement of the student. The formative assessment would contribute to the, the summative assessment. And the 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 assessment information should be collated based on the content and not based on the methods of assessment. So in summary, that is the 
the, the major component of programmatic assessment. Now, how to implement? Now, this is first big thing. Formative and summative assessment strategies are combined. It has been a previous concept that formative assessments uh, generally wouldn't contribute to summative assessment. But in this um, approach, the formative assessment uh, would be formative as well as summative. Formative in the sense that it would be associated with meaningful feedback and summative in the uh, uh, form that a part of it would uh, contribute to the, uh, to the final assessment of the student. Number two, the soft skills cannot be taught and tested in single course. These skills are learned longitudinally over longer periods of time. They have to be demonstrated in daily or habitual performance, means that the students need to be monitored on daily basis. And uh, as we know that these are shaped um, uh, through ongoing feedback. Fundamental to programmatic assessment is elimination of pass fail decisions from each individual assessment moment. So as I mentioned previously that each assessment uh, moment, long case, for example, or short case or OSCE or written examination, they would be added to the similar information from other assessment methods and only then a pass fail decision can be made when sufficient information is gathered. High stake decisions are based on many data points of assessment rather than uh, on single point. Mentors play a vital role in programmatic assessment. They ask questions, stimulate deep reflection, discuss remediation activities, and support the learner in any other possible way. Now, again, and, and a big change here that programmatic assessment is a mixed method of inquiry into a learner's achievement using both quantitative and qualitative sources. Uh, in, in a way, we, we are going back uh, to our previous assessments where the uh, experts' opinions uh, were given a major uh, value rather than uh, marks uh, you know, calculated by computers. A careful balancing of quantitative and qualitative approaches, justifying choices on the basis of assessment. So we must decide what are the attributes which can be assessed by quantitative methods and what are the attributes which can be assessed only by qualitative sources. We may have to uh, give the results in the form of satisfactory or unsatisfactory or good using rubrics. So maybe three categories like unsatisfactory, satisfactory and good rather than giving marks. The traditional approach is to aggregate marks by methods, but as I mentioned earlier, the programmatic assessment by contrast aims aggregation across the methods uh, based on the content. Now in programmatic assessment, modern approaches do not necessarily replace the, uh, uh, the present system, but rather supplement traditional uh, in a simplistic way, we may have to uh, redraw the, the, our assessment um, uh, you know, uh, schemes, our marking schemes. We might maintain the existing system of uh, uh, assessment, like multiple choice questions, uh, or long case, or short case, or OSCE. Uh, and uh, we have to redesign their uh, marking schemes. Of course, there would be some additional uh, assessment methods which would be part of continuous assessment and mainly to assess the, the soft skills. Uh, for example, the uh, professionalism or integrity or humility. 
the central key is the uh, uh, that the program of assessment is set to allow the whole picture of a student's competence. And for this, uh, to assess the whole picture and to get the whole picture, we have to obtain a careful selection of assessment methods, carefully formulate the rules and regulations and design of organizational uh, system. Here is one uh, example. The, let's say starting from here, the competency framework, basically identifying the, the attributes and then accordingly model of programmatic assessment. Then, uh, sorry, then the uh, uh, learning approaches, high stake decisions, and then the, although it appears that it's more of uh, work-based assessment, uh, that is true, but it can also be applied to a greater extent in, in the preclinical years, and then um, group interviews and, and the questionnaires used for evaluation and any improvement needed. Two major routes are sources of information about the overall performance and attributes of a student are used. One is the informal assessment as a routine on daily basis that three degree, uh, 360 degree assessment, supervisor report on soft skills. And this information can be used both formative and summative, also in low stake and high stake uh, decisions. So informal assessment on daily or routine basis is a very important component. Second, formal assessment and formal assessment can be uh, assessment during the instruction, for example, mid posting or mid um, uh, module um, assessment, again, can be used both for formative and assessment and also for low stake and uh, high stake decisions. And the second is what our end of instruction, which we normally conduct in our traditional system, uh, that would be the mainly summative in nature. Uh, using assessment from all sources, uh, for example, in clinical examination, approach to patient can be assessed by professionalism, permission, uh, uh, getting permission from the patient, be careful about the comfort and safety of the patient, explaining the purpose of physical examination, explaining the physical examination going to be done, History taking can be used to assess communication skills and knowledge as well. OSCE stations can also be used for communication skills, knowledge, and psychomotor skills. A technique of physical examination can be assessed, uh, used for psychomotor skills as well as professionalism. And picking up positive findings on clinical examination can also be uh, divided into psychomotor skills and and professionalism. Interpretation of findings or differential diagnosis can contribute to construct of problem solving skills and knowledge. Appropriate investigation and interpretation of results can contribute to the constructs of problem solving skills, decision making skills, knowledge. Treatment plan, including possible side uh, adverse effects again, can contribute to the constructs of knowledge and problem solving skills. And follow-up plans can contribute to knowledge and problem solving skills as well. Prevention again, knowledge and problem solving skills. Uh, looking at the written examination, the modified essay questions or uh, extended magic questions can uh, contribute to the knowledge and problem solving skills uh, attributes. Uh, BAQs uh, can be used both for knowledge and problem solving skills. This is a very important uh, diagram in uh, implementation of the programmatic assessment. Now, all this information from different sources, from, from mentors, as well as from different assessments, they would be um, uh, 
the relate to the central data collection. But remember the, the information we are getting from, from different sources is based on the content, not based on the methods. So all the information is collected in the central uh, data collection. And then this data is reviewed and collated accordingly. And the um, framework applied based on the competencies, milestones, our EPAs, our, our uh, attributes we want to assess. And then the complementary uh, uh, competency level is de uh, determined. And this is determined by experts, not by one person, but committee and not by simply computer calculating the marks. And then this information is shared with, with the students as well, so that uh, through their mentors, so they know what are the weaknesses and where they need to, to improve. So this um, uh, uh, cycle or this process can be used both for improvement or continuous improvement of the student as well as for decision making or high stake decision making means about the progression of the student to the next level. Uh, assessment programs can be tailored specifically to the individual needs of each student. Um, as I was mentioning uh, initially that the programmatic assessment uh, you know, um, concentrates on individual students through the mentors. So by uh, having the, the, all the information and analyze that information. So the areas which need to be improved in each individuals can be uh, identified and a student can be helped uh, on individual basis to improve uh, those areas. Similarly, a mentor based on the, the analysis and collection of information can inform that what are the areas where the specifically the information should be collected about that particular students, because that is the weak area and we need to identify whether student is improving in that area or not. For a student who has had, for example, seven excellent uh, independent mini uh, CX judgments on all criteria, further collection of data is probably not useful. Whereas in other situation where the, the results are highly variable, then more information uh, would be needed in that particular student. And this could be called as the diagnostic decision. Whereas a tailored advice for remediation can be given and that to, to each student, so sort of therapeutic decision. And a prognostic decision can be made in the terms that is the student on the right track uh, to uh, sufficient competency uh, can be made based on this information. So it can be a, a diagnostic, therapeutic or prognostic approach. Now, there, here are some tips uh, how, for uh, uh, implementation of programmatic assessment. Careful preparation and guidance of implementation process is cru crucial. This means that we need to draw the minute details uh, before we implement. Comprehensive attention for faculty development and training for students. Uh, it's a lot of work, time consuming. Preparing low stake assessment, providing simultaneously formative feedback, a meaningful feedback and input for summative decision. Again, not an easy task. And meaningful feedback for assessment for learning is required with each assessment means for every assessment, whether formal or informal, uh, uh, meaningful feedback need to be given to individual student. Again, it's a huge task. So prerequisites, extensive staff training for monitoring and mentoring, uh, training for data collection, data interpretation, and then the feedback skills and uh, time required for that. Meaningful marking schemes, 
distribution of components of assessment into knowledge, skills, attitude, problem solving uh, should be replaced by the uh, new uh, constructs which we want to assess. Creating a balance among uh, these areas and again, using both quantitative and qualitative assessment. Student training again is uh, uh, crucial. Uh, students should be ready for being monitored all the time. It should become a routine activity. Otherwise, students would be scared that they are being watched all the time. So if they have been trained, they have been briefed about its importance and it has become a routine activity that would be acceptable to them. Then understanding formative and summative assessments that students need to be clear about that and as well as uh, they should be able to receive the feedback in a positive way and take appropriate uh, remedial actions. In the master plan for informal assessment, uh, this means that the uh, mentor or the supervisor have to make a report maybe on weekly basis any about any specific incidents or component of uh, professionalism, for example, punctuality, appearance, behavior with the colleagues, reliability, integrity in agency, teamwork, humility. So these are important attributes uh, which are part of programmatic assessment, but they cannot be assessed by numericals, uh, numbers. So here is the, the assessment of uh, of a mentor or a supervisor, and then giving feedback to the student about these attributes. And uh, I'm not talking about just one mentor, it, because the students would be going through multiple postings uh, and uh, modules, and they would be getting feedback on, on uh, similar uh, patterns, maybe by using a pro forma. So we cannot say that this is just based on one uh, uh, single person uh, opinion. Uh, uh, having multiple mini CX uh, uh, with their uh, components according to the attributes which we, we assess. Um, at the, for uh, formal assessment, identifying the meaningful components, for example, knowledge or psychomotor skills for each assessment point. The assessor or mentor notes communication skills, whether they're satisfactory, unsatisfactory, and good. For this, we can prepare rubrics to bring uh, uh, consistency among uh, different um, uh, mentors. And so they would assess the strengths and the weakness. Similarly, for uh, professionalism, also for knowledge and problem solving skills. So we can use rubrics for, uh, for mainly for these uh, soft skills. So feedback and transfer of data through central information collecting system uh, would be part of the master plan. The central information collecting system in programmatic assessment, massive information about each student would be gathered over time and it would not be easy to handle that. So there should be a system of being able to handle this information flexibly uh, is vital and uh, uh, involving uh, electronic portfolio is uh, uh, proposed as one way of uh, handling that information. Now, based on that information, decision making process for progression of remediation is again important and it has to be made by committee of experts, uh, not by, by individuals. Steps in the implementation of programmatic assessment. Number one, the process of implementation of programmatic assessment is not easy and it requires immense support from the management. Being highly resource intensive program, of course, the, if students need to be monitored continuously on daily basis, there would be highly resource intensive program. It requires systematic planning and involvement of all the faculty members 
and thus all the faculty members need to be uh, trained. Formulate a master plan for assessment, which I have mentioned just in last uh, few slides, which includes the following particulars related to examination date, time, duration, frequency, pattern uh, uh, of uh, question paper and mode of assessment, etc. This should be done for each of the domain and subject and across, across the, the program. And the faculty members should be sensitized about the assessment process and the rules expected of them. Ensure that all the examinations, including low state, should have a scope of providing feedback to the students, which will help them to improve. The assessment is not complete unless the faculty mentors uh, their students and aids them in developing their learning goals and personalized remediation has to be encouraged uh, for, for each student. Develop a robust system for collecting the information from all these periodic formal and continuous assessment. Make sure that decisions taken for any students are not biased based on the collective interpretation of all the examination, including informal assessment means because the information is coming from so many different uh, sources. So collate them and come to a conclusion and decisions are taken by a team and not by the uh, head of the department alone. The entire process should be monitored and based on the evaluation, the outcomes of learning and the assessment process should be revised and adapted. Of course, once we implement this system, we need to evaluate and improve. The information obtained from the assessment process should be used to evaluate the curriculum. Now, again, this information, although on assessment would reflect back on the, on the curriculum and its implementation. So this information can be used to improve the curriculum and, and its, uh, its implementation as well. Continuous interaction should be encouraged between different stakeholders for the betterment of the, uh, of the assessment process. Now, there are some issues uh, which uh, are likely to arise when we want to implement the programmatic assessment. And the first one is objectivity and subjectivity. So far, we have always been um, thinking and thought that uh, the Objectivity is the most important and the, all the numerical assessment are most objective. But here is a different view. There is a widespread misconception that only objective tests can be reliable and the subject tests are unreliable. Example, a single item such as a multiple choice test on internal medicine would be so-called objective test but may not be reliable just as a single test. On the other hand, a collection of experts' opinion on certain performance, for example, CNS examination can be highly reliable as long as there are multiple experts and multiple assessments and perhaps observations at various occasions. Here, uh, uh, we can recall uh, the story of long case examination because they have been criticized repeatedly that the sample size is not uh, enough and there's a lot of subjectivity in the assessment of the students. But if we look at, let's say, look at the year five uh, posting, uh, are, uh, year, there may be five or six postings in, in year five. And each, if each posting has a long case examination, so, at the end of the year, we have already done the long case about six or seven times. And on top of that, if you have the annual examination, there would be another couple of long cases examination. So basically we are not talking about just one long case. By the end of year five, students might have gone through so many uh, uh, you know, assessments through long cases, through multiple examiners at multiple occasions. So if we, combine all those, that becomes a very, very reliable data. That is what is meant by uh, the formative assessment 
contributing to the summative assessment. In programmatic uh, assessment, subjective elements are not to be trivialized, but are assessed by optimizing the sample. So uh, as I gave the example of long case, if we have multiple uh, uh, you know, occasions of using that uh, assessment, uh, apparently subjective, but it can become uh, very objective because it the sample size is is adequate to ensure the quality of the assessment the ex exclusive focus on construct validity and reproducibility or reliability does not suffice anymore concepts such as fairness trustworthiness dependability they also need to be included in the assessment and they cannot be assessed through numerical values or so-called objective methods. Such concepts can only be established on the program level and mainly through organizational procedures like second opinion, opinions, independent observation or multiple observation, careful uh, note-taking or interdisciplinary consultations. Feedback, uh, creating a clinical environment that is intrinsically supportive of feedback needs attention. It's not easy. Uh, the, it needs training of both staff and the students and it needs time. Uh, and they, because the feedback, uh, giving feedback needs um, the 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 attention and 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 the environment it cannot be given just uh, and by uh, saying few few sentences. Besides the uh, this is one reason that has been uh, you know quoted by the students that they uh, they did not uh, find the narrative formative. Uh, uh, feedback as useful because the staff had so many other commitments and especially the administrative uh, load and so they were not really serious in uh, giving the feedback to the students or they were serious but there were not enough time and the opportunity for them to sit down with the student and uh, uh, give the feedback indicating the weak areas and the planning the remedial action. Sticking to the process, collecting assessment information, combining assessment information from various instruments, valuing the resultant information to come to a decision and taking action upon these decision is a major uh, massive process. So central information collecting system, uh, decision making committee, deliberation on not so straightforward cases. So here, uh, uh, the when we look at this the decision making so basically this load can be uh, reduced because a great number of uh, cases would be straightforward cases and they may not need too much deliberation to make uh, a decision by the committee there would be only few cases are so called not so uh, not so straightforward cases where uh, the more deliberation may be required by the committee to to make a decision. So the the point I'm trying to raise here is that the decision making committee may not have to spend uh, a lot of time on each individual cases because most of the cases would be straightforward cases and the the weaknesses would have been taken care of during the continuous uh, process before they come to the point of uh, a high stake this year. So in summary, uh, the programmatic assessment can neutralize all the prevailing shortcomings in the traditional assessment system. In programmatic assessment, periodic formative assessments are done and the outcome of each assessment is taken into account for a high stake uh, decisions. This is a major change from the previous thinking. The outcomes of the periodic formal assessments are shared with the students by the mentors so that they can plan their learning and improve themselves. 
informal assessments based uh, about the behavior of the student in the workplace are acknowledged by a team of faculty while taking a high stake decisions means that the, the reports by uh, mentors from different postings or modules about the behavior of the students uh, would play a role in making a final uh, high stake decision apart from the, the, their uh, um, uh, assessment in, in knowledge and skills. And the ultimate aim of this approach is to negate subjectivity and eliminate biased impact on the final outcome. Uh, this is the, the uh, sort of uh, uh, planning model that review data and evaluate, assess current programmatic intervention, identify changes are needed uh, that are needed and plan the change and implement the change. So the, uh, I, I, I realize that it is not easy to implement uh, the programmatic assessment. It cannot be done immediately uh, or quickly. It needs a careful planning and um, resources. So that's why I said that the purpose of this webinar is to bring uh, the awareness about this change. And uh, I'm sure this would be the model which will be used in future uh, assessment in medical schools and getting awareness about it and thinking about it and getting uh, ready to, to implement such plan might be a useful approach. With that, I thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions. Yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Danish. May I ask a question, please? Uh, yes, please. Sir, my question is you have emphasized that the uh, in the traditional system, when we make pastoral decisions, the individual assessment items lose their identity right. and are uh, translated into their allotted marks. Right. Uh, I suggest that when the importance of a particular item uh, representing a particular segment of information related to knowledge, skill, or attitudes. It is assigned a particular bulk of marks. Mm -hmm. That actually is its importance translated in the form of marks. Right. The fact is that for decision making, marks are easier to play with as compared to the qualitative information. So isn't it appropriate program to uh, translate okay. important items into marks and then make the decisions based on yeah. the marks. Okay, the, uh, Dr. Danish, very, very well valid point and, and I get it. But what happens that the, at the end of the day, you know that students have answered sufficient questions. You don't know what were the answers and especially you don't know what were the incorrect answers. And knowing in incorrect answers is a big opportunity to help the students to improve their knowledge and skills. And we are losing that. So just convert, it is easy. Of course, it's very easy to, to convert um, the into number and, and make decision and let the computer make the decision. But we are losing an opportunity to to help the students to improve. So we are simply concentrating on 50% marks. We are not concentrating on the overall um, in, uh, you know, uh, personality and, 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 uh, and the characteristics of the students. So programmatic assessment goes beyond that. In fact, if we are able to apply that, by the time they come for the final uh, so-called so professional examination, through continuous remediation, they might have uh, improved a lot by that time and most of the weaknesses would have been uh, taken care of. Second is there are a lot of attributes which cannot be assessed by uh, numbers only. Professionalism, behavior, integrity, honesty, humility. So we must have some quant uh, qualitative, and that brings back the role of uh, teachers in, in, into making a final decision. Unfortunately, uh, to achieve the objectivity, 
we have forgot the role of, of the teachers in their, their assessment. We have been um, neglecting the teacher's assessment by saying that this is just a personal view. This is a subjective view, whereas marks are really objective. The pro, uh, what programmatic assessment says, yes, if we, we are talking about only one person, this is subjective. But if we are doing the same thing repeatedly by different uh, uh, teachers and they are of the same opinion, that becomes a very reliable information. That is really, really uh, objective information and that should be given uh, due uh, uh, importance. So Assalamualaikum, sir. Can I ask a question, sir? Uh, yes, Thank please. Thank you, sir. This is Aisha Abdullah, sir. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Aisha. Uh, so one, uh, one is a comment and the other is a question, sir. Right. The comment is that um, uh, as far as formative and summative assessments are concerned and the distinction that we make in it, I find it very useless because all assessments should be backed up with feedback and an opportunity for the students to learn. Absolutely. Uh, so I, 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 yes, sir. And I think that the high and the medium and the low stakes tech, uh, assessment would be meaningful, but putting it as summative and uh, formative, should we should not be using these terms. Right. The second thing is, sir, because this translates into a behavior of the examiners as inspectors. Right. Uh, for example, in annual exam, if I see that it's a non-static station, it's a static station, non-interactive, and I have to <clears throat> supervise, um, I have to see a checklist, uh, a student's behavior with regard to clinical examination. And I find that they make a very important mistake. And this is an annual exam. Most of the examiners would not tell the student that you did this wrong and this is how it should be done. Right. So I mark them on the performance that they have. That mark is not uh, influenced by that action, but we need to correct them because this is the annual exam. They won't be coming back to us. That is just if we, if we do not have this thing in mind that this is summative assessment and I'm not supposed to make the student learn. Mm -hmm. That is one thing, sir. The second thing is that uh, the question was that um, uh, in, uh, with regard to programmatic assessment, even the most optimally staffed um, institutions cannot claim that it, is, that it would be easy for them to implement it. So uh, the only thing that the support that I see that we can get if we want to implement it at, at least this in this decade is the contribution of the student himself or herself in the assessment process, because they are more aware of their own self and we can train them to become more objective in their own assessment of where their weaknesses are and they can help us uh, in identifying those uh, weaknesses. That's it, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that the bo both points are really, really very valid, and I cannot agree more with you. The, the, in the first point which you raised, I'm sure that uh, many of us would have uh, this, uh, 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 this feeling uh, once we see the result, oh, that student has passed. He was so poor. No, because the, the assessment uh, process did not capture uh, the whole thing. And I think it's a good idea by, by Dr. Aisha to, to train the students in their self-assessment and, uh, and uh, the maybe using portfolios, etc. students assessing themselves and then uh, maybe discussing with, with, the, with the mentors how to how to uh, uh, overcome those those uh, difficulties? I, that, that's a that's a good idea of uh, involving students themselves in their their assessment. Uh, so for that, of course, we need to train students and to be uh, critical about their own uh, actions uh, would be important. Of uh, Alam, can I ask a, a question, please? Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, we get back to the the actual problem because now the your formal assessment you will have the three rubrics so that's good because but for the informal assessment just now you mentioned about the professionalism and the other that that's the attitude so i want to know the weightage of these two because you will remember when we were working together at a previous university, we had this informal assessment, the so-called attitude. Remember, we had yeah. the format 
Okay. And then we had a, a, about 30%, I think, at one time. Then yeah. we had to reduce that as, uh, attitude component to, I think we did it five or we brought down right down to five, uh, from 10 to five, I remember. So that means the weightage for the informal assessment is less, but the formal you have now three. Uh, yeah. And that informal assessment, I think, also is subjective. You said the teachers have to be trained, correct? But you know, there there may be bias too. And there's another drawback is no, we... Prof, so, so let let me answer that first. Yes. The question of weightage does not come at all. Oh, why is it, uh, Prof? No, no, just let me explain. If okay. you want, if you want a student to be professional. You don't yeah. want them to be 50% professional. Yeah. You want them to be 100% professional. If okay. you want your student to be um, uh, the, the honest person, there's mm -hmm. no 50% honesty. Okay. So the concept is totally changed. The All these uh, attributes, which we are saying professionalism, students must fulfill everything. There's no point of 50% or 70%. So means that if in one posting we identify the student is weak in one area, the mentor would tell the student and would help to improve that. So the, the deficiency which have been uh, identified in first week should not be there on third or fourth week. So there is no question of weightage. It means that it must be uh, cleared. It must be satisfactory. So there are no marks given and added to okay, the final bro. professional. But isn't this subjective and totally relying on the mentor? No, that's why I said that because if the same weakness is being found by many people in let's yes, say five, five or six postings, okay, so that, okay. that, that, that would mean that that is really a, a weakness. It's not just uh, okay. one person. So I get the so point. It becomes so reliable. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Any any uh, other question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I'm, please. I'm Professor Rashid. Uh, yes. Professor Rashid, who may talk? Ah, uh, yeah, sure, please. Right. Uh, right. Uh, one uh, comment and one complaint, and then many questions. Which, uh, if I want, don't get the time here, I'll ask in the group. <clears throat> the comment is that this uh, webinar does not have uh, any uh, this uh, CME points. It does not have any certificate. It has. It does not have any boundness to the attendees. But still, the attendance is more than a hundred, and with the credit goes to you that uh, what uh, well performance you are doing. So uh, we applaud this thing that there is no nothing is being given to the attendees but still uh, more than 100 participants. That's very kind of you, sir. Thank you. And uh, my complaint is that uh, uh, throughout the presentation, uh, you have been given examples from the clinical sections uh, using the term uh, OSCE, Objectively Structured Clinical Examination. But there is a large number of basic sciences teachers here which use OSPI, Objectively Structured Practical Examination. Uh, the P has been converted in many private institutes as passing. They are using as <laughs> objectively structured passing uh, yes. uh, uh, So no, this one. Really uh, let, let, let me answer that first. I'm I'm sorry <laughs> because I no. used mainly the the terms used in clinical. Um, in fact, a recent just few days back, I read a paper. And I was, it was in medical teacher. And if you like, I can share with you. Yes, thank is, you. Uh, that was about the use of uh, this uh, programmatic assessment in basic sciences. And it was really, really impressive. The point they make is that in programmatic assessment, it is not only question of physiology or, or biochemistry, it's question of feedback and preparing the students to be a doctor from the very beginning. For example, integrity, for example, honesty. So we cannot say that we have to teach honesty and integrity only in year five. These attributes have to be from the very beginning. And so uh, apart from, let's say, uh, knowledge, the feedback 
and behavior and uh, these uh, social uh, are, are the, the soft skills. I think I would expect being a clinical teacher that by the time students come to year three, they have already been modeled into really a nice person, uh, a, a nice future doctor uh, by our uh, basic science teachers uh, who should concentrate not only on, on the basic subjects, but the attributes as well. So I think this, uh, especially after reading that paper, I was so convinced the huge role of uh, uh, basic science teachers in shaping up of future doctors. Uh, I, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's commendable. Uh, sir, uh, sir the, we'll be needing that paper. Please send it either in group or... Yeah, yeah I, I, I will share in the group. I will share in the group. Yeah. Right. So uh, my question is that uh, you uh, very rightly you told that one uh, tool of the assessment cannot should not compensate for another tool of assessment. Uh, right. In the uh, many institutes, uh, of course, there is no doubt of advantages of integrated teaching, but the integrated assessment that is the all the uh, I will give an example from basic sciences that physiology and anatomy, biochemistry. Uh, are being assessed together. And if a student gets good marks in physiology and leaves totally biochemistry and can get pass, and we don't have any idea. So right. do you think it, are these things going right that we are totally demolishing the identities of the subject and the students leaving one whole subject and, and they have obtained 70, 80% marks? Please comment. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, that's a very valid point. Now, the I think the assessment has two components, uh, are more than two components in basic sciences. When it comes to integration, that should be problem solving. If we are doing the, uh, let's say, uh, using PBL as teaching, so the integration of anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, or pathology, that can be seen only in scenario-based questions, maybe structured as a questions, where they have to apply these, these concepts. So the marks for that would go to the construct of problem solving skills rather than individual subjects. Whereas I'm sure you would have a separate assessment uh, questions for uh, uh, the, the multiple choice question, exam for physiology and biochemistry and anatomy. Yes. So there, there you should make sure that the result is not based on adding the, the marks of anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry papers, but see that, uh, like you said, the student might, might pass by not simply um, ignoring one sub, uh, discipline at all. That should, not, that should not be the situation. Uh, there should be a minimum, at least a minimum standard uh, that minimum marks should, uh, in one of the institution I was working in was that the, let's say the pass marks was overall 50%, but minimum 40% in each component. So yes. you can, you, you can do that. Let's say it's a, uh, if you are doing anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry, okay, the overall marks are more than 50%, but at least minimum 40% in each. Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah, in this way, you, you, and so one is problem solving where all the integration is there. Other is where you want to assess the basic knowledge. Of course, it is important, but you must make sure that the minimum standards must be met. Yes, thank you very much. Any, yes, any other them. questions? Can, can um, you have a it's not a question, it is a comment. Yes, please. Now, what I could learn is that programmatic assessment is a tool which is a shift from quantitative analysis to qualitative analysis with remedial plans, ensuring 100% exposure to attributes of learning. That's that is right. the nutshell which I, 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 I learned. I think that, that's a very comprehensive definition, sir. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Prof. Harbinda, uh, Riptinder. Okay. Prof. Riptinder, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm there. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, uh, when I was going through this, I was uh, looking at your message you sent me about the modified essay questions. Yes. And now I realized that by going back, uh, by adopting this programmatic assessment, your MEQs would become very, very important. Exactly. Yes. So they, they, as... that, that would be revival of long case, that would be revival of modified essay questions. Perfect. In fact, uh, I did have a small session to deliver on MEQ the other day in the medical education unit. Right. So what we uh, looked at at your programmatic uh, assessment, it's a concept which is actually much, much better, no doubt, but very difficult to implement in the overall aspect. Yeah, of as course. Of, as yeah, of today. Of course. Yeah, uh, that's why I said that we should start preparing for it. It would definitely take a long time and effort to be able to implement it. Yeah, I think it's more of a mentoring uh, 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 smaller groups of students, which will facilitate uh, reaching this target. First, let's get, you know make our mentoring more robust. And then assessment and feedback would be automatically part of it. Uh, that, that's, that's absolutely right, sir. Thank you. Sir, my name is Dr. Nadeem Akbar. I'm from Pakistan. Uh, I have a question. That yes, has yourself, you, in your presentation, you uh, told us that it is very uh, resource intensive and uh, there will be a lot of difficulty in training the faculty as well as to make the student aware to implement this programmatic assessment. So right. my question is, if in the clinical settings, if we start implementing the Ollett and Carte uh, suggested this uh, uh, entrustable professional activities along with milestone, right. the problem will not be solved itself. Assessing according to that program, mm -hmm. Uh, yes, you are right, sir, because by, by that, this means that you, you are choosing EPAs as your uh, attributes. And, yeah, and the, it would be, if I compare the preclinical and clinical, the implementation of programmatic assessment would be relatively easier in clinical years uh, because the students are going through multiple posting in small numbers and they, it's relatively easy to, to monitor. Whereas, for example, in basic sciences, if all the students are in physiology and, and biochemistry, then uh, it would relatively be easy, uh, not uh, so easy, but that means that the mentoring, as, as was mentioned, is, is the key, key there. So if, let's say, uh, normally, it said about 10 to 15 students can be monitored by, by one person. So if that is possible, then the, uh, the, that, that would be very, very useful. While talking about the basic sciences, the, if uh, the mentor can tell the student that uh, although you have passed the, the, the anatomy, but uh, physiology was poor or that area needs to be improved, as well as the, the soft skills. Uh, I think, of course, uh, there's no doubt that mentors are the backbone of, uh, of the programmatic assessment. Prof. Uh, Prof. Alam Chair, yes, this is, please. yeah, this uh, Prof. Shahid from IME Malaysia. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, sir, for a very uh, extensive talk on programmatic assessment, which is a difficult area, actually, in assessment to deal with and lead a lot of faculty training and all but uh, i have few comments a uh, couple of comments not many yes uh, please. the I, I went through the chat box and a lot of question asked is about the philosophy of the progress programmatic assessment formative versus summative assessment issues and the uh, individual or personalized self-assessment leading right. to mediation so right. these three things has been answered very well in programmatic assessment that it is integ integrated, longitudinal, and information rich. Right. This is one about the philosophy. The second thing about the formative versus uh, summative assessment, I would say 
that we have to think of doing away with the boundaries between summative and formative assessment. But in program, programmatic assessment, actually the formative assessment issue, a lot of question has been asked, is not that uh, is totally done away with. The feedback process is there and no decision at point of time that the formative assessment is held is actually taken. So there's no decision and there, there is a feedback that makes formative as a formative. What, what formative assessment would do in programmatic assessment is that it would provide or complement or supplement the is, is student's performance at various resources, at the, the various uh, uh, time, uh, point, uh, time of uh, point, uh, point the assessment is held to contribute to the summative assessment. That's, but the most important thing is who is taking the decision. The decision is not taken by the coach or the supervisor or the teacher. It's taken by a team, dedicated team, who would exclude. The, the, that dedicated team actually excludes the supervisor who makes those the, formative the, 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 That's the beauty of it, sir. That's the beauty of it. That's yeah, the, yeah. right. I, I, and I think you, you have helped me a lot by, by answering those those. Uh, okay, those, thank uh, you. And, uh, and lastly, and lastly, Prof. Uh, Alamshir, yes, uh, that the, uh, the, uh, there is no remedial, former remedial in programmatic assessment. We have to understand. Remedial is based on the self-assessment. The student has to identify their issues, their problem in, in the process of learning. And they, they have to find a time to do the remediation with the help of the supervisor. There's no yeah, formal yeah, yeah, remediation. Yeah, sir, uh, as you see, the, the remediation is a continuous process. That's right. That's yeah. right. So that's it, all my that's comment. Why, uh, that's why I was saying that if it's implemented properly, by the time they come to, to the final stage, all the remediations have been done already. That's right. That's, no, right. that's the beauty. And it's determined by the individual, the, the students themselves, not by the coach or the supervisor, when yeah, the remediation right. will be done. Yeah. That's right. Thank you yeah. very much for, for, uh, for just one question, Prof. Can I ask? Uh, yeah, sure, please. Yeah, Prof. Actually, uh, thank you very much for that concept. That's really wonderful to hear. Now, my question is like uh, your uh, programmatic assessment addresses the preclinical and the clinical, uh, preclinical and clinical students or years, right. but does it uh, uh, also uh, addresses the number of the student per batch? For example, you know, in Pakistan public sector university where number of in each batch is 300 or plus. So right. is it going to be implemented or can be implemented to such number of students? The, now, the one way is that when we come to the mentoring, we involve all the staff, both clinical and preclinical. That is one way so that we don't restrict the preclinical students to preclinical staff and the clinical to the clinical staff. That may be a one one uh, uh, way. Other is, of course, then if the number of students is too big, then the mentors need to be trained and, and the, the expectations made clear that uh, a one mentor has to take care of, for example, 20 mentees. So yeah. the, the, of course, the manpower question would, would come there. And I, I don't pretend to say that this would not be a problem. This would definitely be a, a problem because we, as I said, this is a resource intensive. Yeah. So uh, the, the, there's no doubt in that, that uh, the problems would, would be there and uh, uh, we have to find some, some way for that. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Professor Sher, may I, may I share my feeling, please? Uh, sure, please. I have uh, thank you so, so much for bringing, always bringing, uh, you know, um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, bringing solutions to challenging issues. Uh, Professor Sher, uh, actually, there is always a bit of anxiety. Uh, you know, some of the, uh, our colleagues, they think that it's like a U-turn, you know. First, we, you know, change in, in long case is not okay. And we went for uh, uh, this objective structured examination pattern. And then we are again looking back to that. Uh, my uh, suggestion is that uh, this is going to be a cultural change. Whatever we did in the past was to uh, solve a problem, uh, an issue. 
and right. here is an issue again so right. for that we have to again is do some sort of entrepreneurship some sort of innovation the way you are doing it mashallah right so i think we what we need to do is right now the general principles that you have shared our thoughts that you have shared if right. at uh, this point in time if we start just using those principles and see how we can make a cultural change again till the time there is acceptance on the stakeholders administrators uh, you know organizational level and then individual faculty level then right. ultimately i think these things they are going to work and we are going to strike a good balance inshallah thank you so much no uh, thanks thank i i think that's that's a very useful useful comment sir and uh, uh, that the practical uh, how uh, the the humble start and then then improving on that yeah uh, dr uh, nasda dr nasda yes thank you thank, thank you prof alam for uh, your nice and informative as usual uh, webinars uh, i have a question and i have a comment the question is you uh, you mentioned that in programmatic assessment you uh, there is a committee who uh, decide on the uh, on each student and uh, my question when this committee do the decision session is it every year or only at the final no the this the committee would be mainly where the progress is needed progression let's say from year 1 to year 2 or year 2 to year 3 whereas intermediate they you may not have such a big uh, committee uh, the intermediate would be mainly through to mentors so so where so the high stake decisions high stake decisions would be taken by this committee so they there is a need for doing this uh, session six time through the uh, six year of medical student uh, yeah medical uh, program like, like previously we prepare the result we calculate the marks and we say that student has 50% so pass if 49% mm -hmm. fail but now would be that uh, the each student would be assessed by the committee and mm -hmm. and made a decision but as i said that majority of the students would not have a problem only few few of them only few of them would have problem and that need to be deliberated okay. because others okay. would remedial action would be taken along the way okay uh, thank you and the comment was about uh, i tried one method for the oski that uh, and i share a preprint in the in the chat uh, group and also send it to you uh, the idea is to uh, collect the uh, marks on each domain uh, separately and by this we get many um, many examiner who assess the student for example on history taking and we will uh, have a mark on that domain so at the end we can plan a remediation for each uh, student individually we say that this student is not pass in that domain and he need to work on that or he need to that, that's be re-examined on this that's that's the most appropriate way and that's what the programmatic assessment is uh, is promoting yes. i think that's that's the best way uh, of doing that now i, I thank, think you, thank you very time much is, I, I, uh, time is catching up uh, i'm sorry prof so so we can talk uh, uh, afterwards um, i have few uh, couple of uh, slides to share with you and something new uh, i want to share this time the uh, if if, uh, if uh, you remember uh, while uh, uh, you know, discussing the policy of this forum, we decided that we should not be, or we would not be conducting any surveys on uh, uh, on this forum. Now, recently, uh, I was approached by a, a postgraduate student, uh, MHP student from Pakistan, and she need to conduct a survey uh, for her thesis. And we deliberated and discussed about that, and uh, uh, we came up with a proposal that if that student is willing to pay one USD, or uh, not pay but donate one USD to to any deserving person 
in their community are are the organization one usd per questionnaire then uh, i i thought i can uh, you know request the members to um, answer that survey so in that way each of our member would be contributing to the charity by filling one form means you would be contributing uh, one usd to the uh, to the to the community or to the deserving person and for this survey we need only 30 uh, participants so uh, i'm appealing to to all of you those who want to take part in in this charity i am calling it a survey for charity um, so please uh, send me a whatsapp message and i i will uh, uh, send the the form to you i have filled that form it doesn't take even 5 minutes to uh, fill that form but i think it would be a good uh, activity on our forum to promote uh, charity uh, uh, like uh, we do for uh, for our webinars so we can do for uh, this survey as well so please whatsapp me uh, i don't need many people only 30 persons and that would be a good contribution uh, to the uh, to the to the community uh, the second uh, as you will our next webinar but uh, we would not have uh, this webinar in april uh, mainly uh, because it would be the uh, fasting month and uh, we we thought that we will skip uh, and the fasting month um, and we will have the the webinar in may and anyway this is uh, um, completion of one one year so maybe one month uh, break after one year uh, of uh, these uh, webinars and the final my usual uh, you know uh, a request that to each participant please donate one usd or equivalent amount in your local currency to any deserving ind individual in your neighborhood or any public welfare organization in your community uh with that i thank you for uh, your uh, participation and uh, continuous support and inshallah will will see you again in in may in the meantime we will keep on communicating in our group uh, and we'll have uh, keep on discussing on on different issues and uh, uh, again i will be uh, waiting for uh, your participation in the survey Thank you very much everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you still have some questions you can always uh, uh, write to me in in your WhatsApp group and I will try to answer as many as possible. Thank you.